Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. Today, sales engineer Brian Jones will be discussing how to optimize project workflows by setting up custom equipment lists and creating and using custom project templates in Signal Pro. These best practices for streamlining the process of setting up projects and designing networks will decrease planning time and reduce costs. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box on the webinar control panel, and we will answer them at the end. Brian, the room is yours. Hi, thanks, Rory. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining today. I, I see some familiar names in the uh, the attendee list. It's, it's good to see uh, some folks join for this. Um, like Rory said, the, today's sort of theme is about really uh, leveraging some features that have been in Signal Pro for a while, as well as some new features to help reduce the overall project time end to end uh, from the time you, you know, first get the specs on the, the prediction that you need to produce to the time that you have some end results. We're looking at all the ways that Signal Pro can be customized to help you um, reduce that project time. And so uh, I'll go ahead and, and jump right into this. And like Rory said, if you have any questions, make sure and type them into the question pane and we'll, we'll get to those at the end. Um, and uh, as you can see here, I've, I've got a project started that I'll, I'll come back to in a moment, but this is sort of my project all set up in a state how, how I would like to have it if I was starting a brand new greenfield project where I needed to import some site locations and run some predictions to, to start doing a design for this area. Uh, for the sake of argument, this is how I'd like a new project to look when I start it up. And, and that's sort of what we're gonna dig into today is how to get your project to, to open up the first time uh, already set up with everything that, that you typically use. So just for contrast, let's go ahead and look at the process of, of starting a new, new project. I'll, I'll just save this for the moment and come back to it. So if I go to File, New Project, we get this dialog where I give the project a name. So maybe example Eugene. It goes in the project folder. And the project template here, this is a piece that uh, I've noticed in my own trainings, a lot of users will tend to gloss over. They'll either start with just the generic project template that's there, or maybe they'll grab one of these other default templates that install with the software. Um, when you first install Signal Pro, it comes with some standard templates for a typical cellular or LTE or microwave backhaul link project. And these are really examples to help you see what you could do or, or some, of the, some of the ways that you could set the software up. But this list, is completely user configurable. And so the main best practice that we'll be talking about today is setting up your own project templates so that when you start a project, you can pick from a, a short list of your own personalized settings. So just for example, I'll stick with generic here. And if I enter the city of interest in and click find, it gives me, you know, the the only city named Eugene, and it gives me some coordinates here. And this is just where the new project will be centered. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to this. If I create a project template that's customized and then make a new project based off of that template, I can still center that project wherever I like and all the other settings will stay the same. So let me go ahead and start this from a generic template. And this is what a lot of folks uh, will, will do when they're brand new to the software. They'll just start a project. And then, you know, if I use my project tree on the left here, I can sort of go top to bottom and work through setting up all of the essentials of my project. So right now, if you look at the status bar on the bottom, I don't have any terrain. My status bar is not quite set up the way I'd like. So I want a land use there and I, I don't have any databases. So I would need to go in here 
and set those databases and check to make sure they're working for both terrain and land use, and then, and buildings if I have them. And then I'm gonna need to go in and set up my propagation models because I've only got sort of generic default models set up here. And the same, of course, goes for all of my radio equipment, and the same goes for my map layers. Uh, maybe I don't want these world geographic layers, but instead, I want my, my Bing satellite imagery. Um, you know, all, all of these steps start to add up to a lot of time, and then I'll, I'll start to go enter RF equipment, and maybe I discover that I don't like the power units that we're using. I don't like DBW, I prefer DBM. Uh, maybe I need to set to decimal degrees. All, all of these little items are the things that wind up, for one thing, taking a lot of time to correct uh, and, and set up in your project. And for another thing, and, and this is almost the more important issue, every place where you need to go and make a correction from your initial project settings, the, that initial project template, that's an opportunity to make a mistake. You know, I might enter a value that's different than what I wanted in terms of my default equipment height, or I might point to the wrong uh, clutter attenuation file with my clutter data so that it's not being utilized in the way that I wanted. You know, all of those places where I have to go back and change things, again, are, are an opportunity for me to make a mistake, and we'd like to reduce those opportunities as much as possible. And so that's really where project templates come in. And uh, the project template allows you to set up literally everything in the project from your databases to your propagation model settings, all of the standard uh, RF equipment. So in other words, when I, uh, when I go to pick a site configuration and create a new site, all of these templates can be included with that new project template. So what I'd like to go through is um, the process of setting up one of those project templates to your own custom preferences. And, uh, and we'll take a look at that. Uh, and also some steps along the way where uh, some, some other ways to speed up the process um, that are, are maybe underutilized. Um, again, I like to use the project tree as I'm setting up a project. Uh, this, this tree on the left gives me a good checklist for going through and making sure I'm addressing all the important points. And like I said, the first step to setting up this particular project would be that I have no terrain data or uh, clutter data for this area yet. And so that brings me to uh, the first um, the first important new feature from EDX, and that is our EDX Cirrus Geodata subscription. Uh, a lot of you folks are familiar with this already. Um, it, it used to be that really the only realistic way to get high resolution terrain and clutter data for your projects was to either source the data and convert it for use in the software yourself, if you're kind of an advanced user, or to approach a data vendor and have them provide data in, in the formats that you need. And they would sell you that data permanently. And oftentimes the expense of that was considerable if you wanted a high resolution. And also the time to delivery could be a major problem. We've, we've heard from our users that it may take uh, a week or more uh, to even find someone who has data for their area and get pricing and you know actually get that data and then the the time to produce and deliver that might also be uh, days or even weeks depending on the area you're looking at and so our EDX Cirrus service is uh, our attempt to offer uh, much higher resolution data than would normally be affordable and to also get around that time to delivery problem by having the data on demand. So let's say this Eugene, Oregon area that I'm interested in is a brand new location that I have not done a project in before, and I don't have the geo data yet, 
but I do have my EDX Cirrus subscription, and that's good for this year. And it means that I all, all of the tiles that I have a subscription to are yellow within this EDX tile selector utility. This utility comes with your subscription, and it's how you set up the data to download on your machine. So if I want to drill in here and look at my project area around Eugene, Oregon, here we go. This is my area of interest, and you can sort of see the boundaries between tiles. I'm going to go ahead and use this selection tool, and I just want this one tile of data. And that, that's going to highlight my area. Of course, I can draw a box around, you know, the whole country or a whole state if I needed that. I can grab as many tiles as I want. And uh, if, if the download is too big, then we might have to, to deliver that on a physical drive or something of that nature. But if you've got a reasonable size and a reasonable data download, you can get this all delivered to you right through an FTP link that'll get set. So I select my area of interest and I'm going to go into this data set selection. And this gives me all of the data that I have access to with my Cirrus subscription. So if I don't have any terrain or clutter for this area, I can simply highlight that tile and say, oh, you know, for, for this project, I want to go ahead and use the five meter uh, US clutter, which that's a five meter grid resolution, but it also uh, loads and operates pretty quickly in the software, uh, especially con compared to the one meter resolution, which I might use if I was doing, um, you know, a, a high frequency project or something where line of sight was really crucial and I wanted to make sure that um, I was using the most granular data possible. And uh, I would also select the terrain data layer that I want here. And then when I've got uh, my area highlighted, I can just go right to download here. And it's going to ask me where it should send my download link. And it'll prepare that data, send me a link a little bit, a little while later. And I can download that onto my local machine to be used whenever I want. And uh, so that we're not demonstrating how slow my download speed is on this machine today, uh, I've already downloaded my data into, I've got a little uh, solid state USB drive that I uh, have connected that I keep all of my, uh, all of my United States data in one big folder here. And uh, you can definitely do that with your Cirrus data, or you can divide it up on a market by market basis so that you have a, a smaller data set to plug in when you first start a project. So if I come back into Signal Pro here, uh, again, I'm the, the way that we make a project template is to first set up the project itself uh, and, and set all of our preferences. So I would go ahead and go in here and um, set up my terrain database. I choose the EDX PTX format for my Cirrus terrain data. And then this is going to be down under my Cirrus data drive. There's my terrain, there's the folder it's in, and I check that as active. And then once I've done that, my, uh, you know, it'll take a moment to, oh, well, maybe I pointed to the wrong folder. It'll take a moment to index that terrain folder and uh, uh, I'll start to see terrain elevations down here on the status bar. I tell you what, in order to make this process a little bit quicker, let me jump over to my project that I've already prepared here and we can review th through things so we don't have to wait for data to load and, and that sort of thing. So again, I went in here and, oh, I see, I, I chose the wrong format. My data is in PTE, not PTX. Again, every time I set these things up uh, manually, it's an opportunity for a mistake. So if I create my projects from a template, I'm safe from that mistake. And you'll notice down on the status bar at the bottom here, when I mouse over locations on the map, I've got my terrain elevations showing up properly. 
And of course, I've done the same thing for my land use, land cover data. I point to the folder. I point to the attenuation file that goes with that data. And down here on my status bar, I've got uh, my clutter categories showing up. And just in case you haven't seen this uh, Cirrus five meter geo data yet, let me go ahead and zoom in on this downtown area for Eugene. The Cirrus clutter data is what we call hybrid clutter, where our data vendor has compiled together uh, data from a whole variety of sources, including the national land cover data set, but also a variety of municipal and state sources so that we have a lot more granularity in the features uh, available within the data and also more categories to the data. So you can see here, I've got, um, for example, this yellow area is developed low intensity, but that's distinct from actual buildings. Um, and we've got actual building footprints here. And it's also distinct from uh, the roads thoroughfares category which is all of my you know, transportation corridors that oftentimes make very good propagation corridors for RF signal as well. If I had sort of standard lower resolution clutter data from the national land cover data set or something like that, none of these road uh, and, and highway paths would be distinct from the surrounding developed clutter and so um, I'd get only a very generalized picture that, well, this area is urban and I wouldn't be able to see the actual street canyons and I wouldn't know where the actual building footprints are for major buildings. And as you get out into the rural area, uh, these building footprints become uh, less available and the clutter may get a little more coarse. Let me go zoom out into a, uh, a rural area instead. So maybe uh, out here, for example, we've still got really good uh, granularity of different forest types versus open and field types. This is all pasture down here. And then we've got uh, scrub forest and then heavy evergreen forest. And, and these distinctions, again, come from multiple different data sources so that uh, if the data is available from some state source that you would have to go source specially, we've already rolled it into this, uh, this data set. And uh, this is data that if, if you subscribe to the area, you can pull this down for your area of interest, uh, again, within a day uh, and, and be working within you know, just a few hours, potentially. Uh, depending on the size of the area you need. Uh, so once I've got my databases set up, the next thing I want to do is specify the prop models that I'm going to use in all of my projects. And for the sake of simplicity, I've set myself up a prop model setting that I want to use for mobile or area type studies. And then one that I want to use for fixed uh, backhaul link type studies. And you notice the real difference there is simply which clutter loss method I use for the two. For my fixed links, I want to use the add clutter height to terrain height so that I'm sort of guaranteeing line of sight. And for the uh, mobile type studies, I want to use the clutter at point. So it's going to take the loss at the received location um, to account for, for local effects around a mobile at the ground. And uh, those, those are the only prop models I'm going to use as a default in my new project template. So that's ready to go. And then under the RF systems heading, we have uh, what we call equipment templates for each of these different equipment types. So for example, just to talk about our sites, if I click next to the new site button here, I've got this drop down with site templates for a typical site. And I can use uh, edit template to go, go in here and set a name. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice in my project here, I've, I've kept it all uh, non-denominational and we've got vendor X 
and vendor Y, my two different equipment vendors, that I want to compare their equipment in this particular project. So I've set up a template for each one of the different base station types where I've input my frequency, I've set up my study radius and my study point spacing, all of that stuff, my transmit parameters. And you'll notice uh, I have the checkboxes on here for the use transmitter type database, use antenna type database, and the receive parameters as well, use receiver type database. And that grays out some of these fields so that I don't have to enter, for example, my transmit power value, or I don't have to enter my antenna gain. If I want to, I can always uncheck these and input explicit values. But these type databases allow you to pick your equipment from a quick pull down list. And in, in just a couple minutes here, we'll take a look at how to configure those drop downs. But if I have set up my RF equipment list, it means that I can just set up my site template also using those type databases. And um, again, that's a place where I now don't have to manually enter a value and that saves me time and protects me from making mistakes. And I've gone through and set up, you know, I've got a 100 watt Omni, I've got a 50 watt Omni, and then maybe my other vendor has a sectorized solution. So on this template, I've added multiple sectors. And again, I, I can specify everything with a template or I can point explicitly at the antenna pattern that I want. And uh, I've set my, my sector azimuths to be 0, 90, 180, 270. And um, that makes it so that if I want to add one of these sites on the map, I can just quickly select the one I want, click the new site button, and place one on the map. Uh, and I'll know that it already has all of its properties set up correctly. And those templates, those site templates, or if we're talking about a point-to-point -point link, then this is uh, a link template. Or if we're talking about a fixed subscriber for multipoint or a CPE, then I can also set up the CPE type templates where all of the subscribers I import will have one of these CPE types assigned to them. And uh, again, that allows me to just pick from a drop down what equipment I want to place and drop it into the project. Let's, let's uh, take a quick look at those RF equipment lists that I used. So again, inside the template here, if I have this use transmitter type database switched on, it activates this pull down list, but where does this pull down list get populated from? If I cancel out to here and go under my RF systems menu, I can get to it either here in RF equipment list, or again, this handy project tree on the left has RF equipment list right here, and I can pop this open. And there's an important best practice here that I, I want to uh, make sure I'm clear about. You'll notice that I have pointed to files here that are inside my my documents edx folder if i want to be able to edit my rf equipment list files then they need to be in a folder where i'm allowed to make file changes right so the first thing that i want to do is in my my documents edx i've created right next to my projects folder i created myself uh, a folder called rf equipment files and I put those tables for uh, transmitter data dot dat and receiver data dot dat. I put all those tables into this folder under my documents. If you need to find some examples of these files, you can actually find those inside your Signal Pro installation. So if I go into library data equipment, you'll see I've got these same files tx data rx data etc but but these are examples of these files and you'll discover 
if you try to edit these files from Signal Pro here in this location, Windows will complain and say, hey, you, you can't save to that file there. So what I do is just go ahead and copy that entire folder out to my EDX, my documents. And that gives me a, a working folder of those files that I can make edits to and change on the fly. I also copied my antenna patterns out here and uh, I keep my whole antenna pattern collection under my documents. And again, that's just a best practice to avoid any file permissions issues that might come up as you run the projects or as you point to different equipment files. So in the RF equipment list dialog, I've pointed here to my transmitter data, um, receiver data, receiver mobile data, that's for my mobile remote units. And then I've also got a uh, transmission line and antenna types or antenna patterns. And if you click this edit equipment list data button here, you'll be able to see and also modify the contents of these tables. So this is where that drop down list gets populated from. I've got different base station transmitter types, and I'm going to put in uh, the name that I want to use for them, their maximum transmit power, their minimum transmit power. And this PSD file code, that stands for power spectral density. If you have a curve that describes the power per frequency uh, roll off of your channels, you can use that file to, to represent that for different base station equipment. And using the zero just means we're, we're assuming a flat roll off to our channels and we're not using a power spectral density file. Under the receiver equipment here, uh, same idea, I put in the name of the equipment. And in this case, I've got a noise figure a C over I requirement, so this is the signal uh, over interference plus noise that I need in order to have what's considered a good signal for this receiver. And I've got my uh, channel bandwidth or equivalent receiver noise bandwidth. This filter code is the same thing as that power spectral density code. It's a curve that describes the um, gain per frequency or roll off per frequency of the receiver filters. And this adjacent channel rejection is the amount of rejection, uh, the inter interference rejection you'll get for a perfect co-channel uh, interferer. So if something's in the very next adjacent channel. For my mobile remote units, I similarly uh, specify the receiver details and then I've also got a simulcast capture ratio and a transmitter output uh, maximum and minimum, and again, a receiver filter file and adjacent channel rejection. Over under my antenna types, now this one's a little bit different. Here, I, I'm pointing to an antenna pattern file to go with that, you know, I've, I've named this 6dB Omni, and I, um, oops, let me click on this. I browse to the location where I have that antenna pattern file. Um, so maybe, uh, I don't remember which one was my 6DB on me. Maybe this is the guy. Um, I would go ahead and point to that antenna pattern there and then save this. And you'll notice the this directory token, whether it's in the install path or the antenna path path, this is so that you can transfer your projects from one user to the next on different machines and have it maintain the, the file path location. If you choose none, it uses a hard explicit path. If you choose the uh, install path, it'll look in your Signal Pro install folder wherever that might be, or the antenna path path. Um, <clears throat> so once I have set up all of these lists to have just the equipment that I want to use in my own project, then I can save each one of these tables. And when I close out of this and 
again, I can look at, uh, let's say I make a new site here. If I wanted to go change what transmitters on that site, I can just go in here and grab from my drop-down list and it'll automatically change the values and, and recalculate as needed. I can also use my spreadsheet editor to import a bunch of these. So under the RF systems menu, if you go to spreadsheet editors, let's say I have just a, a CSV table or an Excel spreadsheet of the latitude longitude coordinates where I need to place these sites. I can go into the site data spreadsheet and up at the top here, I've got the, the template that I can choose from. So if I need to create a bunch of these 100 watt Omni sites, I choose that template and I can use this import from CSV. And I think I've got some site locations right here. So if I look at that table here, I've got simply, you know, from uh, from the customer potentially, all they really have are these site locations. And I can either just copy all of these from Excel, you know, if this is an Excel spreadsheet and it's it's got other extraneous data in it, maybe I just want to copy those values. But I can also, if if the table is formatted correctly, I can go ahead and import directly from that CSV and it'll bring that in. And when I click OK now, I'm going to have sites in all of those locations. And they'll all be already set up to look just like that 100 watt Omni site template that I set up. And so at this point, uh, I'm ready to go ahead and, and potentially run some studies. But let's say I have um, more information than that. Let's say I've got some antenna heights and pointing angles and things that are going to be different from one site to the next. In order to bring in all of that information, I need to look at the sectors data spreadsheet because the sector is, uh, you know, in EDX nomenclature, a sector is a base station transceiver, any, any transmit receive system on a site. And if I open up this spreadsheet, you'll see a whole lot of parameters that might be irrelevant for your particular use case. So for example, if I go to my default template here, or my default spreadsheet, I've got all this stuff about repeaters that I'm not really interested in. Maybe I have system type and, and all of these other columns in there. Um, that, that the value is going to be the same for all of these, and I just want it to populate from the template. I can actually configure this sector spreadsheet to show me just the columns that I'm interested in, and I can save those configurations. So if I right click on one of these columns, I can go to Hide Show Columns, and let's say I'm, I'm only interested in a couple parameters here, so I'm going to just shift click all this other stuff and go to hide and maybe i want my receive antenna height in there and my transmit antenna height and my frequency but you know maybe that's all the parameters i have for my for the sites i need to import so i'll click ok and now i've got this nice tailored down spreadsheet where i can cut and paste values right into here and create new sites where each of them maybe will have a different antenna height, or maybe each of them is going to be on a different frequency. The nice thing about that, though, is once you've set up the table the way you want it, you can save that column configuration with this Save button. So I'll go here, and um, maybe I'll call this. Actually, let me, let me make one more change here. I'm going to take frequency out, hide that guy, and I'll call this one just heights. I go to save column configuration. I'll say I, I've got my antenna heights. And I can go back to my default table. Or you can see I've created another one here 
in a previous project, I created a table called Simplified, and that's got my frequency, my antenna height, and also my azimuth orientation and beam tilt. So if I have sectorized antennas and they're all pointing different directions, I can import all of those azimuths and all of those beam tilt values. But then every other parameter, every column that's currently hidden is going to be automated, automatically populated from the template that I have selected up at the top here. And uh, that, that saving of this spreadsheet can save you a lot of time. If you're always using the same spreadsheet format, then you can export these site locations to a CSV and maybe you need to import those sites into another project or maybe I want to export just particular sectors from my project, I can use this group functionality. So let's say I, um, I go put just a couple sites into what I'm calling group one here. I could export all of the parameters for that group one through my sector spreadsheet. And if I use the, the correct configuration here that I've saved. Maybe I do want my antenna pointing angles and stuff. I'll use simplified. I'll go to import export and say, okay, just show me group one. And there they are. And I can export those to a CSV table. So if you get good at using these spreadsheet editors and you make sure and save the column configuration you're comfortable with, any new project that you open is going to have those same uh, the same column configuration options so that you can quickly set up this spreadsheet and import your assets. Um, the same goes for all of these spreadsheets. So if I'm looking at fixed subscribers and I want to configure my spreadsheet for the subscribers, I can do that as well. And again, that's that gets saved globally to your EDX installation. So you can use those tables on uh, on any project. Let's talk about just a couple other preferences I might have here. Under the map menu, maybe I have uh, map units that I want to use. Again, I'm using decimal degrees and I like watts for my power units. Maybe I want a DBM, I can switch. And you can switch on the fly between these units safely. If I go to DBM, all of these values have been translated from watts, which they were in originally, into DBM. So I can go back and set this however I like. And proceeding on down my project tree list here, I can also set up my map layers the way I want, which we talked about that. I can drop out the world geographic layers, bring in my Bing layer. I've already extracted my land use and clutter, as you can see. And then maybe I want to set up the area studies that I typically run, or the route or multipoint studies that I typically run. I can set those up and make those a part of the ultimate project template as well. So if I go into area studies here, and I set up the received power study that I'm always going to run, and I go into style, and I set up the signal and color levels that I'm always going to want on my project, then I can have these studies in the list ready to go. And when I create my project template based on this project, those studies will already be set up, and they'll already have their color scheme associated with them so that I don't have to set it up in my new project. And uh, the same would go if I was going to run route studies or fixed multipoint studies. It really, any setting that you can have in a project will go with the project template when you set it up. And that includes site information. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the implications of that right at the end here. But let me go ahead and make a template from this project. So let's say I'm completely happy with this, this as, as my uh, template project. 
including the sites. I want to be able to make new projects with those sites included. I'm going to go ahead and save the project I'm working on. And then I'm going to go up to the file menu here and go to manage new project templates. And here again, I can get rid of all of these other project types that maybe I'm, I'm never going to use the default paging template. So I'll get rid of that. And uh, same goes for this uh, mobile radio template. I'm, I'm using my own template for that. So I'll delete this. And I want to create a template based on the project I have open. So I'm going to hit add template. And I'm going to call this example template. And click OK. And <laughs> You can see I now have to use my rename function and turn and correct my spelling. And then I'll close this and let's go ahead and create a new project again. So I'll go to file. I'll, I'll first close this one and then I'll go to new project and I'm going to call this example two and under my project template this time. I'm going to choose that example template that I just created and give this city of Eugene again and click OK. And you can see immediately my project has popped up and this is a new project with its own folder so I can safely make any changes that I want to this. But I've already got my databases set up. If I go to take a look at the land use, it needs to re-extract that land use data to create a new cache file because again, this is a new project folder and it's, you know, uh, it, it hasn't created any finished predictions or anything like that yet, but all of my presets are there. Uh, you, you notice my site templates are still set up properly. All of my RF equipment list information is still correct in there. And most importantly, my studies are already run and they already have uh, the color scheme associated with them and everything. So let's say my, my aim for this particular project is to say, well, what, what would happen if this site were offline for some reason? So maybe I'll, I'll just turn that site off and, uh, Actually, for the for the sake of argument, we'll turn all but one of these sites off. Um, I'm going to go into my site data spreadsheet here, and let's say let's say I just want to delete all these. Since my project was developed from a template, I'm not messing anything up to just delete a bunch of stuff and mass from my project. And now I want to go ahead and run the receive power study for just this site. And it'll go through and run the radials. And again, if if the project that I designed my template from, whoops, I guess I am pointing to a bad antenna pattern file here. My mistake. Looks like I need to correct my template before I uh, go correct or build my project template again. And now it's just uh, it's finalizing the study results here. And again, if you have run studies in your previous project and then created a template from that project, the study files don't necessarily go with it, or, or they re rather they do not go with it. And so any studies will need to be recalculated. But that also means that the new project is lightweight and there's not uh, a lot of uh, large files included with that. So here's my receive power at remote study for this uh, this site now. And my layer's already set up and my colors are already set up. And um, so
so at this point, I would be ready to go into study queries and run the query for, you know, how much of my study area is covered by that particular site. And in this case, it's pretty good. Um, let's see, I want to make sure I haven't, uh, oh yeah, so this, this covers, uh, the, the idea of if, if you have an existing network, let's say that, um, I'm responsible for a network that's already been built out, but it's growing and I want to be able to add new sites to the network and, and try out different changes to the network without modifying my original project, I can use the project template function to take my, my finished as built existing network project and build a template off of that. And since the actual transmitters come with the new project, I uh, will save this. So again, if I uh, make another new one and choose the example template that I built. Uh, maybe this one's up in Salem. Actually, I don't want to do that. I want to stay in Eugene, don't I? Because that's where my sites are. So these, these sites and all of their configurations are included with this template. So this is the right way to set up a template for an existing network that you want to be able to make changes on and check out what the differences would be in, in a new safe project. If I wanted to build a template for greenfield deployment, the only difference there is I would make sure that I did not have any existing sites. So I'd go in here to site data and I would just delete all of these out. And the same would go for if I had any CPEs or any links, that kind of thing. I would delete those out and save the project and make another new project template off of that. And maybe we call that uh, maybe we'll we'll call it uh, Greenfield. How about that? Okay, and close this. And when I go to start a new project from that template, then I've got all of my presets ready to go. My site templates, my equipment templates are still here, so I'm ready to start adding sites, but I've got a completely greenfield project where not, there's, there's no existing equipment except what I add. And so I like having a template for both of those cases, the existing network and a greenfield template. And if you've got all of your equipment preset in there and all of your databases and your preferences preset, it really should be just that fast to jump in, drop some equipment in either by hand or through your spreadsheet editor. And again, if I've configured that spreadsheet, then that stage of, of setting up the spreadsheet the way I want should be very easy as well and quick. And then I can run my studies and go to my study queries and make my export. Uh, and so from end to end, from getting the geodata from Cirrus, which should take, you know, if, if it's a fairly small area, you should be able to get that within the hour and bringing it into a new project built from a template. I should be able to get results from a new study right then that day within an hour or two, um, even if it's a greenfield project that I've, I've never really looked at before. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Um, Rory, I guess you're uh, you're looking at the questions pane at the moment. Are there uh, uh, are there anything that uh, anybody'd like me to clarify, or is there anything you'd like me to clarify? Yes, yeah, so you mentioned um, that uh, something about sharing the the template files. So if I create a template on one computer, uh, is it possible to share to coworkers or to other computers? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's a good point. And one of the best practices that we really recommend, and one of the things we'll often 
uh, help a team to do when we do custom training is to develop that project template and share that throughout the team so that everybody's on the same set of best practices. And the most important part of that, again, boils down to this My Documents EDX folder. If everyone on the team uses the same standard and the same folder names for putting their geo data into that folder and all of their RF equipment into that folder, then those paths, you know, in, in this particular example on this machine, the actual path name has users Brian in it. But if I transfer that over to your machine, Rory, where yours is going to say users Rory, the, the software knows when you have put something inside your My Documents EDX folder. And so as long as you're all using the same folder names, you can trans transfer those projects or the actual project templates from user to user and have everything uh, pointing in the right, uh, pointing to the right path. Are there any other questions? I'm looking here through them. Um, just one moment. Uh, so if you would like to run multiple studies, uh, how would you keep the results? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, if you would like to run multiple area studies for different geographical areas, how do you keep the results for the different studies available for viewing without having to rerun the studies? That's actually, uh, since, since you have to set a new study grid uh, in order to look at a different area or a different area, then it, it's actually a great use for the project template scheme. And you could just make a new template off of that project and go start up a new one and set your study grid in a new area. If, if you have to move your study grid around within the same project, that's going to force you to recalculate any studies that were done on the, the previous study grid. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think it's much faster and better to just go ahead and maintain multiple different projects for those different areas. But if each of those projects was based on the same root template, you can be assured that all the equipment settings, prop settings, et cetera, came with that original project. Okay, and if, uh, if I were to go back and make any changes to a template, uh, file, would that have any effect on my projects that are based off of that template? Good, good question. So I originally, you know, when I go to manage new project templates, uh, sure, let's save that. When I do the add template here, that is when it takes the settings that are currently in that project and applies them to that template and saves it. So I made my my example template this morning from this project here in in my projects folder I've got demo template if I wanted to make a change to that I would need to open up the demo template project so I'd open this up and you know whatever the change is maybe maybe I decided I don't want these sites after all I want this to be a greenfield template I can get rid of those. And now in order to get that to apply back to the project template, the actual, you know, what, what it's going to create when I start a new project, I have to go back and uh, save the project and then go and specify that again. I would have to add that template um, and call it, you know, example template. Uh, Otherwise, it's going to keep the settings that I originally built the template from. So that's that's a good question. You want to you want to watch out if your existing as built network has changed. You'll need to go change your existing as built template as well. And getting a process in place for when to do that is is uh, certainly an important consideration. Well, perfect. Uh, it looks like uh, it looks like that's uh, all of the questions that have come in for this 
Uh, and if there's any questions that come up after the fact, uh, you can always reach out to anyone here at EDX, uh, whether that's support at EDX or one of our individual email addresses. Um, Brian can give you his details here in just one moment. Um, it looks like there might be another one that just came in. No, it doesn't show there. Okay, perfect. So, uh, Brian, if you want to give your contact details, if anyone has questions on what they've learned today. Yeah, absolutely. My email address is brian.jones at edx.com. So that's B-R-I-A-N dot J-O-N-E-S at edx.com. And uh, feel free to reach out to me or to the support team if uh, you have any, any questions, if we can help you set up your project templates. Um, we're, we're happy to help you do that. Uh, also, if anyone is interested in looking further at our Cirrus subscription geodata, if you'd like to have access to that data and you don't yet, uh, feel free to reach out either to me directly or to our sales team at sales at edx.com. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Brian, for presenting today. Um, again, if there's any questions or anything for follow-up, support adx.com. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining and have a great day.